for me, music's always been there. It's like the, there was never a time when there wasn't music. I can't remember that. It's something I feel I was born with a connection to. And it's very humble beginnings because I was brought up for the first eight years of my life in a two-roomed tenement house in the northeast of Scotland. We didn't really have a record player, but um, there was what we called then the wireless set. I was born in 1954. And I was thinking about that. How did I first hear music, you know? But actually, we'd hear music from the wireless, the radio, but also that my family, part of my family were musical, a bit musical, and singing was a very natural thing to do. So everybody sang, and I was, didn't even think about it. And then later on, when I was just a little bit older, I was sent to sing in a choir. And I loved it so much. I loved singing with other, other children, other voices. And music be just became my thing. I just, um, it's always been like a friend. Yeah, and, and so how old were you when you um, started singing in a choir? I was about six. Oh right, so really. Mm -hmm. I was about six and then um, when I was seven, I had a chance at school to um, apply for uh, piano lessons. That was the real kind of special moment. And they accepted me, so they sort of said, well, you can sing in, in time, you can sing in tune, you can, you can keep a rhythm. I, I didn't know I could, do I, I, I could do those things, but I didn't know that it could be broken down like that, yeah. that you could assess a child's musical ability by seeing what skills they could follow, right? Yeah. So I could follow those skills very naturally. And so I, I, got piano, I got piano lessons, but my parents didn't have much money, so there was a little bit of, they had to keep a bit aside to pay for the piano lessons, you know? And there was a piano. I don't know how we acquired it. There was a piano in the house. And, um, and that's really kind of how it started, learning piano very, very slowly, one note at a time, learning the scales, learning with two hands, you know? It's, um, it's a work-intensive thing to have a skill to play piano or play an instrument of any kind. 100%. Yeah. People talk about the, sort of, you know, the 10,000 hours and things like that. And, You're right. Uh, and, you know, it, se it seems like yeah. because you were singing, playing from such a young age, that, that would have really yeah. helped you develop. And then, and then, so you, later on, you went to Royal Academy of Music. Well, it kind of goes on from when I didn't what, what kind of just you jump. You didn't just jump up. No, there, not so really, because... What, um, what, what kind of led to you going to Royal Academy? Well, it's a, it's a long story, but I'll, I'll try and keep it compact for no, you. No, no, I want to hear, I want to hear the whole story. <laughs> it's just so funny, because I think about it now. It's like, I ultimately, I'm known for being a singer, performer, songwriter. But that was never anything kind of, it was never on the horizon for me. I mean, I thought maybe I might be able to be a teacher, but I didn't want to be a teacher, but the kind of profession was something far less, um, well, this is really what, how it ended up is so far-fetched in a way, coming from a northeastern town in Scotland, ending up singing with this, um, blues, R&B, soul, influence, kind of, just, that's a whole other thing. But how I got to the Royal Academy was basically because, you know, you had to pass different tests. So you had to be proficient. So you had to, ha you know, you went through these grades and it starts with grade one and it goes all the way through to grade eight and you have to be really good. You have to pass these things with distinction. And when I was 11, somebody said at school, there's a flute that's become available would you like to learn how to play the flute? And I was like, yeah, I'd like to learn how to play the flute. And uh, so I was given this flute, just, it was on loan. And it was an old one. It had little uh, elastic bands to keep the keys bouncing, you know. And it, it was, I was obsessed with this thing. I wanted to learn how to make a note, how to blow and create a note. And, um, it's, the flute is so weird because you kind of, it's transverse, you kind of blow across it. it is, it's kind of antithetical. And your, your hands are like this and like this. You can't see your fingers. Whereas the piano, you're seeing everything, you know? Yeah. And the flute is an extension of your, your breath. And you have to learn how to do all of this. 
So it's, like <laughs> it's all a bit like singing. This. Yes, it's linked to singing. That's the that there is a connection somehow because yeah. you, it's a it's a, you have to take an inspiration. You have to take a quick breath, and you have to learn how to calibrate that breath and how to utilize it through phrases. And uh, w when you need to maybe use more of it towards the end of the phrase, which is really quite hard, you've got to be physically and mentally prepared for all of those things. So um, I got to the Royal Academy um, because I'd, I'd studied flute and I'd gone through all the grades and I played in little orchestras in my hometown of Aberdeen and small chamber ensembles and military bands and like did all this kind of local s stuff. And actually, you know, got, I thought, I'll, tr I'll try to go to music college. And I had a picture as to what that would be. And at the time, there was a TV series called Take Three Girls on the BBC. I think it was on BBC. And it was about these three girls, and they were all classical. One of them, I think maybe all, or one of them was a classical musician. And they lived together in this flat in London. And I thought, it's going to be just like Take Three Girls. I'm going to go down yeah. to London. It's going to be fantastic. I'm going to be playing in these chamber ensembles. It's going to be great. There's going to be the Royal Albert Hall. I had all these pictures, you know. It was very, yeah, very cool. And it had this theme tune and everything. You know? <laughs> and I thought, oof, it's going to be like that. I was so nice, so innocent, so naive. It was about 15 or so when I had this picture, you know. And, you know, I worked hard to get to the audition. Had to go down, scary had to, you know, play the pieces. They were all like flute concertos. It's a high standard, really. Yeah. But it's just like all kids that come from provincial towns, they might be the best or as good as the best in their town, but when you get to London, you're meeting all the other ones. And it's competitive, so to get in, it's competitive. And I did get a place at the academy. My first choice was really the Royal College of Music. That's really where I wanted to go, but they kind of, let me know that there was another person that they were choosing between me and the other person. The other person was a, ma a young guy. And they, they said for, for me as a woman, it might be better not to do the performer's course, but to kind of settle for the teacher's course. And actually, I didn't, I didn't want to be a teacher. So I was like, oh, OK. <laughs> All right, I was, I'll go to the academy. So I spent three years at the Royal Academy of Music knowing that I wasn't good enough. I didn't like it that much. Yeah. I didn't fit in. And so it wasn't like that, that kind of... It wasn't the take three girls, take three girls you know, the bubble, happen. the picture in my mind. It just like, somebody just went pop. The bubble popped and it was like taking the tube and the bus from Camberwell to get to Regent's Park to... And I had no money, none. I had, but weirdly enough, I had what they call a grant. So in those days, students could get grants. It's a bizarre notion now, because yeah. students get loans that they have to pay back, but then you got a grant. So I had this grant, but I always had a part-time job so that I could just cover a little bit more than my rent and food and transport. It's, it's and tough in London. It was very tough. It was very lonely. It was very tough. I lived in bed sits. I counted that I probably lived in about 22 or 23 different places over wow. a very short period of time. Because each place I would stay six months in a bed sit. I think, oh, I've got to get out of this place. I was Finsbury Park, Earl's Court. I mean, wherever I lived, Fulham, Camden Town. So all over. Crouch End, North London, South London, West London. I, I learned what London was about. And did you, so, you know, you had this notion of London before you moved down there. It was but just a was dream. It, was it actually quite, you know, because it can be quite isolating. It was right? really hard. It was really yeah. tough. And, you, you know, I didn't realise that, but actually, you know, when you don't have the money to go to the cinema or go to the pub or go from, to I never even thought of going into a restaurant, you know, for a meal. That was off my limits. I just li lived like a little church mouse, I just kind of saved all the money that I could, recounted it very, very carefully. In some places where you lived, you know, you're putting coins in a meter to make sure that the electricity lasts through the weekend. And if it's yeah. full of coins, then it's in the winter time, it's too full. So you have to wait until the landlady comes and empties it. And you're just like freezing. freezing. And without, as you said, hmm. without you know, money to do things like go to the theater and stuff, 
it's it's, actually, it's, you know, it's, it's quite edgy. A small accommodation. And I thought, you know, it's funny because poverty is all relative. So I wasn't exactly absolutely poor, poor, but it was kind of breadline stuff. And I didn't come from money, so nobody ever, you know, supported me in that way. I didn't expect it, but yeah. I just felt I was just this dreamer that my dreams are just being popped, pop, pop. And that's maybe where sweet dreams come from. Sweet dreams are made of this. It was like at the, at the time that Dave and I, we're approaching creating a song where we were always songwriting, creating songs, recording songs. And this was really, Sweet Dreams was very self-deprecating. And it was written and recorded very spontaneously. And the thought of Sweet Dreams are made of this, who am I to disagree? It was like, what's the point? I mean, nothing is going to come into fruition. It was very, it's a very twisted little mantra that was spoke. It was a, it was a kind of reflect, a self reflection, of whoa, you know, you have your dreams, but maybe they don't come true for you. You know, whatever your dreams are, and that everybody is looking for something. Yeah. Everybody's looking for something, and it's true. It's now, you know, all these years later, Sweet Dreams was recorded. I think 1981, 82. It's a long today, time. Really. It's still because that truth. That Still truth hear that song is, in, yeah, in but clubs. but people people hear "Sweet Dreams" as a celebratory song, like "Happy yeah, Birthday." But it's actually a bit you more know, dark. It's that. much more dark than that. It's really, it's about the human condition, actually. That Do for you me, feel that those years in London were what, what what kind of informed that slightly, you know, darker undertone. Definitely. It's really interesting. Yeah, but that. I also already, you know, I felt like an outsider in my hometown. I, f I still, I'm an outsider. I'm an, uh, uh, that's who I am. I'm, if, if I have to describe myself in relation to the world, it's like I look at the world through my own lens and it doesn't belong to groups or tribes. It just doesn't, I'm not nationalistic. I'm not like, oh, I come from this country and that's the, I mean, I love Scotland, that's where I'm from, but I don't hold like this view of, I belong to this sports team, I, I support yeah. them, or it's very much like I'm a fly on the wall. Taking observing. and things from different... All the time. But just making it all your own, seeing yeah. it in your own way. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And when, so when, so during that period, did you think like, how am I going to make my dreams come true? Mm. Or did you have it? What were oh, your very dreams? much. Very, Dave and I, in Eurythmics time, we, were, we had already been in a band called The Tourist. The Tourist, yeah. And uh, we, we were not the main songwriters. Pete Coombs was the main songwriter and the main singer. And I was like the side, I was doing like mainly harmonies or singing along with Pete. And we traveled, I mean, we made three albums and we had a record deal and we even had a hit record, which ended up being a bit toxic because it was a cover version in a kind of par paradoxical way of a Dusty Springfield song, I Only Want to Be With You. And it was kind of, we did it in this kind of slightly aggressive post-punk new wave style. And, um, and, it, and it, people liked it and it sold a lot of records at the time. But it ended up being a bit of an albatross because they identified, you know, the, the, you know, the, the music press at the time were incredibly hard, hardcore and scathing. So if you yeah. didn't fall into a category that they really liked, they put you down and it was hard, you know, you felt like when the music press hate you or just, well, they didn't hate us, but they didn't, we weren't their darlings. We were not the darlings of the music press. And I Only Want to Be With You became like the tourists, well, wow, number four, we're playing on top of the pops, great. But actually it kind of took us down at the same time. So I always look back on those days with the tourists and it was a few years and it was a lot of gigs it was yeah. a lot of traveling. How many gigs did you Oh my God, hundreds, hundreds, hundreds. I've got somewhere, I have, a, I have thick re, uh, ream of paper and every single tour and every gig is marked on this sort of archive. Did you keep the records yourself? Or? Someone else kept it. I don't know how we managed, I don't know how this came about. Somebody else or other people put it together and I, you know, I have never actually done that thing of publishing it or anything yeah. like that, but it's That's there. Awesome. And it shocks me when I see it because I think it's like, you know, 
Düsseldorf, Hamburg, Berlin, uh, Munich. Then it's like it's like all the European main main cities. And then it's, we went to Tokyo. And then we went to Australia. Wow. And it was just on, it was America. Which, the first time I came, I was sitting here with you in Los Angeles, right in the heart of Hollywood. And um, the first time I came to the United States in the early 70s, I had very mixed feelings about America and the, um, the American dream. You know, I came from a, quite a kind of radical, more left field uh, perspective. And so, everything American, I had like f funny mixed feelings about it. But we landed here, actually the first time we came to America, we were in New York. We, we did end up in LA, we, we stayed at the Sunset Marquee, which is the notorious rock and roll, rock and roll hotel. hotel where all the bands used to stay. You know, we did the whole kind of, we lived at the Tropicana Motel at the beginning, there's now a car park here. We sort of, looking back, it's classic. so extra. Yeah, we were doing this kind of road trips. It was following, like doing the same clubs all were they the way. Good memories. They're blurred memories with bits that jump out. Yeah. You know, strange things like seeing the Cramps. There was a band called the Cramps, and they were staying at the Tropicana Hotel at the same time as us. And they were nocturnal creatures, obviously. And they came. Out. I remember the sun was going down. I've got, it's all like pictures in my mind, and they sort of came out of their hotel, a couple of motel doors opened, and they came out and walked past the swimming pool, and it was so exotic, it was so, oh my God, you know, here we are, and there's the cramps, and yeah, just strange. Really well, you see, what That's I think is, work. it was, it was tough, and I was a woman, like, people used to ask me this question constantly, What's it like being a woman in rock? And I say, I don't know what it's like being a woman in rock. Why are you asking me this? I mean, I don't know any different. I'm just me. Yeah. I'm just me, and we're just doing this. What's the difference? But now I look back and I do, I do actually think being a woman in this very male-dominated uh, creative industry, you could call it, um, was different. It was different, because I couldn't be one of the guys. I couldn't really hang out with the guys, you know. What do guys do? Well, they, get, they got up to all manner of things. Yeah. And I mean, I didn't want to be with them either. So it was kind of singular. So it was a singular place. Right? Yeah. And also, um, I was talking to you earlier about the voice, because I just lost my voice for a few days. That's why it sounds a bit more husky. I don't know if that's more appealing or less. Oh, I think it sounds it's great. a husky voice. But Actually, I prefer to have my voice in a better state than this. But in order to save one's voice, when you're doing gig after night, after night, after night, after night, and you're not really hearing yourself very well because you've got a monitor system that's crap, and the bass drum ear. is right behind you, and the bass is it, and the, and the, and the guitar amps are cranked up to 12. <laughs> it was uh, scary because you always thought you're going to lose it. And you inevitably kind of did, and that was like so. You just had to try and not talk and take care, and you know, when you're with people and you can't talk, it's not very sociable. Yeah, really difficult. And did you did you during those early days even you know? I mean, I guess they weren't properly early days because by this point you're you know pretty successful. But um, it was always it was, it was always like this. Everything felt like on it. Everything everything felt like. Um, felt unstable. Yeah. Imagine. Everything felt like, I don't really know whether to trust this. I don't know who this person is coming to talk to me and what their motivation is. And when I look back on interviews that I gave as a young woman, you know, I'm my 20s, late 20s, I was very uh, defensive because I didn't trust anybody really. Well, and also you said about the music press. You know, yeah. If you're getting slightly like, it I felt a bit crazy. hammered by the music press, and it hurt, you know, it does hurt. The critics are fierce at times. And I mean, I'm not complaining because I mean, a lot of people have said a lot of stuff and always will, and it's like that. I mean, not everybody's going to love you. You know, some people love you, some people hate you, and you learn to be someone that can take you that, it. you know? Somehow you say, okay, remember, you want everybody to love you, you do. You want everybody to love the music that you're making the way you love it. 
you want them to love to be to love the music, love you for that. And they don't, and they say so, and they say it vehemently, and they say it personally, and it's hurtful, and you want to go, and like there was one time with a journalist that, you know, it doesn't matter, but at the time, I was so feisty. I wanted to go to the office, I wanted to get them, I wanted to beat them up. Yeah, fair enough. You know, because it felt like I had been beaten up publicly, but I had no it's, recourse. It's the same thing. <laughs> I actually kind of think like, you know, it's good to praise, press and it's good to say listen to this it's really great is there that much point really in like writing reviews like this is not very good well i don't know maybe I'm, it's in the public interest if someone's like massive already I, I, I don't know i, I don't, I don't little, know a little destructive see now like we have social media so everybody can post their opinion and it's, there's no holds barred and um i must say I feel very fortunate in the sense that, I mean, I use, I use Instagram, I love Instagram, I love Instagram particularly, yeah. because I like taking imagery and I like making little comments and I'm very aware that people can come and take it any which way they can, but you know, if somebody says something and it's really hurtful or it's nasty, I just delete it, I just say, I'm not having that, I don't like it, yeah. and it's gone, it's gone, that's just how it is. And it's, a, it's, a, it's like, I want, I'm a communicator, and I want to engage with people. I want to know what they feel, what they think. They may not agree with me. I'm fine with it all, but I just, it hurts when someone's nasty. That's natural, yeah, you know. Yeah, it's giving a big platform to people. Yeah, it is. And they can hide behind their screen. They can. Abusive comments, yeah, but actually, yeah. if they were face to face, they wouldn't say They wouldn't say anything. No. So, so, um, so we've gone we've gone on tangents, no, but it's, it's all been, it's, it's all part really of the big. It, I look really at it like um, there's a lot to say. There's a lot of history. There's a lot of archive. There's a lot of experience, and I've just been sitting in the room next door, signing vinyl, because that will be sold or given away, or I don't even know what even's going to happen with it, but. It's sort of beautiful because this format of vinyl is back to its original f sizing where the art, I've always been into the visual aspect of things yeah, of and the vinyl aspect, you know, with Eurythmics and with my own solo work, it wasn't like we ever brought in a stylist, somebody to tell us this is what you're gonna, this is, <laughs> it's not like that. We did it, mm -hmm. I did it, I worked with the graphic designer and kind of guided it and said, this is what I want, this is what we want. And we were right in with them. We, didn't, we couldn't just like be, okay, they're gonna do it. Like the very first tourist album, just a funny little sideline story, you may keep it or not. I think you will. <laughs> it's like, wait and see. But it was called The Tourist and we had this beautiful, Classic. I think Gerard Mankovic took the picture, if I'm right, I could be wrong. But there was a beautiful classic shot, I thought, at the time, we were sort of half, in, half in shadow, half in light, and we were sitting, we were really poised, and I thought, there was something very classic about it. I thought, this is an album sleeve that you can see in a decade to come, it'll, it'll last, it's great. But we were recording something next in Germany, we couldn't get back to England, and somebody in the record company just decided that they would put this logo on our record, and that was it. And it came back to us, you know, in those days, we didn't even have fax. We didn't have that. We didn't have like digital downloading, none of that. Yeah, Everything yeah. had to be cut and pasted. And this person put the tourists in a bright, you can still see it if you get, you know, go into some flea market, so get secondhand vinyl. The tourist logo is in bright pink. It's like new wave on this beautiful classic picture. It just sort of destroyed it. I, I cried. And I also felt violated because I felt they don't care that we care, but they don't care. They just did it. Yeah. But it was just because they didn't mean badly, but they didn't have the time and there it was. And that was the first time I felt the industry doesn't care. The industry is abusive and we're creative. Oh. We're the creative people and they are just selling biscuits. Yeah, yeah you know? that's true. And it hurt so much. And I thought, ooh, I have to be so careful of these people because They'll do something, and they maybe don't mean to make a mistake, but it's not what you want, and you have to control it. And then they think that you're being difficult because you're saying, "You say, right, I yes. want, could it be like this? You know, I don't want it like that. I want it like this." But particularly when you're leaving yourself open to people saying this and that about whatever you, you know, 
whatever your record is, however it looks, yeah, your concerts and or whatever. You're so living with it. You're living with it. Industry, you, have to you know, it's your life. It's like a representation yeah. forever. Yeah. Forever. And it's like you need, like if a painter paints a picture, and it's then it, there it is, a special masterpiece. I'm just using a. It's like when you're aiming to make a masterpiece, and there it is. You know, that's the painting. He's not. He's not going to go back and change it because some critic said, blah blah blah. So that's it's it. It's done. It. It's done. Yeah. Same with music. Once it's once it's on the vinyl. Once it's been recorded. You know, it that it's out there in the zeitgeist. For, and you you can't go. Ah, oh, if only I had sung it different. If only we had used that brass technique. Blah. That's why in the studio, every detail you're responsible for it. You must listen to it right down to the knob. And when they say, okay, this is it, you've got to be pleased with it. Yeah. Can't second guess it. Do you look back, so all of, all of your work, all, all of the you know, like huge variety of things that you've recorded and sang, um, do you look back at anything and say, I'm not happy with that? Or... Um, I think uh, I'm mainly happy with it. I think I'm mainly I mean, satisfied. I, I think I am, but I think... Um, Sometimes there's a bit where I say, oh, I'd love to, mm, maybe that, ah, that. But Those on the, ho on the whole, or, you know, yeah, there might be little things. Because, well, here's the thing that's like, sometimes they were recorded before you'd really perform, got to know them really well. Like you, if you uh, perform night after night after night, you discover new things in songs and you think, wow, that was an innovative idea and it's maybe not on the record. That's the best thing about seeing great artists live. They work with their songs. They work with, it's they always different. Song something for a few years, and you're literally just totally. Like, oh, I could do it like that. I do uh, know that although nowadays, for quite some time, I stepped away from performance. I stepped away from music. You know, I'm much more of an advocate, an activist. I'm very, very involved in women's rights now. So it's kind of like sections and chapters of my life. But the chapters of my life where I was living that, it was not. People talk about the profession. This is a profession. You have to be professional. I lived it. So every day when I woke up, I knew I have a gig to do at the end of the night. And I knew that I have to check my voice, make sure I've got enough energy, that I'm well enough rested. So because I've got that moment to step on stage. And that's going to last for, at those days, we used to go on stage for one hour, 45 minutes, maybe two hours. And I'm going to be off that stage late at night. And then I've got to go on a bus and travel through the night. And I have to do the same thing again. And you know, every night I would just run through the whole set from the beginning to end before I went to sleep. And I couldn't get to sleep unless I'd done that. Uh, what you'd, you know, what, how you'd sang it. Yeah, I was just re, I was just like, okay, okay. You just cannot get away from that, that thing that you, you're doing. But just going back to what you were saying about the music being different, I believe, I think most musicians will agree with me, that a good song can be played on, accompanied by a guitar, could be sung a cappella, could be played with a, you know, an accordion, or it doesn't matter what the arrangement, play it on piano. If it's a strong song, it'll carry. Yeah. Just like, just like that. It doesn't need all the other stuff. All the other stuff is just interpretative. So, so, so it come, you know, comes down later, you know, Melody, word melody, basically. Yeah, and chordal, and cor chordal prog uh, progressions. progressions. Yeah, chordal really progressions. Point. Yeah. yeah. I think there's one song particularly that really sums up yours. There's obviously, apart from Sweet Dreams, which is obviously the classic song that has just gone on and on and on. And it seems to be timeless. And it's kind of surprise. It took me by surprise, really, that song. Uh, that, that it's had this longevity and this freshness still and it means such a lot to people. And people still come up to me every day, randomly, and say things like, your songs, and they're talking about Eurythmics and my songs separately, your songs have meant so much to me in my life, it got me through and I'm like, whoa, I don't know you. <laughs> You're a stranger, you know? And that, I have to say, though, that is the time when people come up to you and they say things like that. People come and give me flowers, even like a man came and gave me a huge bouquet of flowers wow. out of the blue, just like, this is for you. And it kind of was like, wow, because that was what we wanted to do. We wanted to touch people. 
We wanted to make people feel something. What we were feeling, what I was feeling, you know, in those lines and those lyrics, like, it, that it actually touched people's hearts and minds, so, yeah. yeah. And that it was a back, part of a backdrop of all the other musicians, that, the other uh, music makers that they were listening to at the time. It's very, very, I get goosebumps thinking about it. So, Here Comes the Rain Again is a classic Eurythmic song. It's beautiful, it's haunting. And it's really moving, and it is about an inner landscape. When you see the video, it's an outer landscape. That was it. But actually, it's about an inner landscape of rain as a symbol for depression. Here comes the rain again, falling on my head like a memory, like something that you've already experienced, but you remember it. Falling on my head like a new emotion, like I'm experiencing it as if it was for the first time, although I've, I'm used to it. You know, that all the Eurythmics lyrics, um, They're symbolic, They're metaf they have metaphor. And so you have to kind of almost like break them down to say, well, what, what does that actually mean? Although it can mean anything, it doesn't matter. But for me, as the lyricist, like main lyricist, that is what I'm trying to get. I'm trying to find these incredible play with words that make you feel something. Yeah. That it's beautiful and sad all at the same time. You know, it's like poignant, make you feel tearful, make you feel this, ecstatic feeling as well. Yeah, and it's lots of, yeah, it's lots of use of metaphor in it, and just, it, it, it evokes what, you're, what, what the music does as well, just, you know, if you put them on a page, the lyrics like that. They, it's quite, it's something. quite rich, it's quite, it's like a, there's many layers going on all at the same time. Yeah. And the strange when I always say, you'll talk to musicians and they will always refer to one thing with you, major to minor. They'll always talk about that. Because that's that is the, the point, that is the sweet point. That is blues. Blues goes from major to minor, and it's the minor, aching, painy bit. And then the major comes through, and it's it's like, wow, optimism. And I see that as the parallel for the whole of our existence. Our human existence rubs between major and minor, positive and negative, dark and light, the whole time. Yeah. And that's why music is such a mystical, magical, powerful thing. It's a language all to itself, three-dimensional, invisible stuff. That's a really, really good point. If you talk to, you know, your African-American musicians, that's the core. You know, they're talking Alabama, Mississippi, slave trade, pain, generational pain. Music is... Anthropological music reflects the society in the times. Music is about observation and feeling. And music is also a vehicle to express how we, how we are inside. So it's cathartic. It, lets, it allows us, it gives us the opportunity to laugh, to cry, to dance, to scream, to wail, to sing. And to celebrate, it, it, you know, it unifies us in an audience, you know. And it's, it is, it's, it's an ecstatic, if you look at Bob Marley, you know, he's smoking a lot of ganja and he's, you know, a deep Rastafarian with a deep mystical belief in Zion and Rastafari and all of that. So when he is in communion with his music, it's his deep spiritual being that he's sharing yeah. with the world. Amazing. Yeah. It's not, nothing like it. No. no other art form that, you know, that cathartic, as you say. Um, and so here comes the rain again. Is, uh, it's... That's, what, that's what you'd highlight. That's what you'd highlight if you were to say... I mean, it's... Well, it's one, so it's, it's one it's song, one. you know. There's it's, so many. There's so many, yeah, exactly. And so many different records. And what, what you know, if you, if you were to say one Annie Lennox album. Okay. Well, Diva. Is it Diva? Yeah, I guess. Diva, because once again, you know, like when I, when I entitled that album Diva, um, it, it was uh, everything that I do has a little bit of a twist because I don't think things are necessarily always straightforward. They're not just that simple. It's not interesting if they are. Yeah. So I sort of entitled myself Diva because I was going to be a solo artist 
and I was at this point, and I played into the diva, you know, I put the feathers on. I went through all, in the video for, uh, I think for why, uh, I'm, going, I'm going through the ritual of performance, so, you know, I know it very well. You sit in, you face yourself in the mirror, you, f you take up the artifice of performance through makeup, through clothes, through gesture, whatever. So I was, I was kind of like representing the diva and creating the diva, who's, I'm not a diva, but it's a perception, you know, it's and it's a persona. Yeah. So I was like, okay, I'm, I'm kind of like creating this persona and here it is. And I'm stepping through being me, who I am, Annie, just me, into this, which is another level. It's a, br yeah, it's a brilliant like, concept, especially for like, a first solo record as well. It was like, it was the reveal. I mean, I, I, you know, even that concept and that title would have contributed to this huge success for you. And beyond, obviously, the strength of the songs. I think um, you know that you're sending out messages to millions of people. And it's, it's a very thrilling thing to be able to do. And you kind of have to take ownership of uh, these messages that you're sending out. And intellectually, where are you coming from? And what are you referencing? And what is common to you and them? What are they connecting with? Yeah. And you can't, like, I don't think you can um, write music or do any creative art to try to please an audience. I think it, it, it comes down to maybe quite um, a self-focused per, uh, person. You're not, you're not, you cannot second guess what the, what the audience is going to want or like. It has to, you have to be the critique. It has to be authentic. Yeah. yeah. And so therefore it has to come from yourself. Because if you're like, oh, I'm going to write this because it might get into the charts, no. then it's like, you know, no, 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 no. very good. No, it's, it doesn't work like that. Yeah. It's, it's got to be okay. You have to kind of, whew, I don't know. It's a really strange thing, and I think everybody wants to know what's the formula. What does it take? What does it, what does it take to make something that people just go, whoa, that's otherworldly? You kind of want to make something otherworldly. You can't put your finger on it other than it's just unique. And uh, I think, well, every single artist that we've interviewed, musician we've interviewed for this series, is totally different, and that, yeah. that really... You know, that Uniquely really themselves, up. authentically themselves, and that's it. You have to become, you have to actualize your, whatever it is about your individuality and your connectedness, you have to actualize it. And it's almost like alchemy. You know, talking about it, it's almost ridiculous to talk about it. Because the words can't, they can't explain, it, yeah. right? But I know when I'm listening to music, like when I'm really involved with the music or creating music, I it's a language. It's like it's like a magic thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I, I truly, agree. truly. And I had to find out, you see, because. When I talked to you earlier about learning music, you know, by rote, and I'm so glad that I did, because if I hadn't been taught that way, I wouldn't have been able to write. I write notation. That's how I've historically written songs. I've written, really? yeah, I, I write, I write it down, you know, the notes, because I'm a luddite. I don't know Dave, for example. It's just like so, so fast with. Um, technical things. So in the 80s, when you could get particular synthesized sounds through certain kinds of computers and drum machines and what have you, Dave was like very forward thinking like, okay, now forget about having to have a band, you know, this, this, this player doing this and that. No, or going into a big studio with a huge mixing desk. No, we can go, if we get, it, if we get enough money from the advance and the record company, we'll purchase our own gear which is what we did. And that's how we got it all together in a, in, a, in a little space. We were our own, like we were our own producers. We were our own, we're recording ourselves, our own en engineers. Yeah, we had the freedom to do the grammar. Totally, it was our thing, you know? And we were just doing it, like cooking, home cooking. That was early Eurythmics. That's what we were all about, which was great at the time. Yeah, I 
mean, that, that would have been one of the huge contributing factors to how like, fresh and original it sounded. Right. And unique it sounded. It was so exciting to experiment with sound, and you know, and one individual that we both were hugely, hugely uh, impacted by was uh, a man called Connie Plank, who died many years ago, and it's so sad for me that Connie is not here. He was very young when he died. I think he was about 46, and Connie is kind of legendary. Um, you know, he was the man who kind of helped Kraftwerk create their sound, and uh, Mobilis and Can. They're, they're very particular electronic sounds, DAF, these kind of electronically obsessive, Groups came together and they came to Connie's studio, which was a, in a little village called Neunkirchen near Cologne in Germany in the 70s and the early 80s. And uh, Vienna, you know, um, with Majur and, and what were they called? The band, Majur's uh, band, had that classic uh, song Vienna, and that's Connie. Yeah. That's it. And it was just like working with Connie, the, it was like the whole world of sound opened up to us, that we could be experimental and we could go far and we could use sounds that people would say, no, you can't do that. No, 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 you can. Let's do it. Let's get excited about using this kind of wild sounds, you know, like let's go and bang some glass bottles or tinker with this and let's see what, you know, let's capture it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's Connie. That's Connie's influence. No, it, it, it does seem, you know, going going through all the stuff that you've done, that it's just been, it's that, that and it's the same for everybody who's been in this series, that, that you, you know, it's that passion, passion for what you totally. do, that anyone who set out to try and be such a great artist would, would fail unless they had that, like, completely sincere passion oh, for boy. creating a I mean, and, it is deep. It's not that you just come kind of like, ooh, I'll just think of us. No, 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 like no, no. You wake up you, and you think about it and you go to bed. And you, you live it. it. And you live it, yeah. You live it. It is. And I always say when Dave, about Dave and I, like one and one, him and me, we made three. It was more powerful than one. It didn't make two. It made three. Yeah, I like Back that. Back in the day, Everybody you know. Everybody always says one and one and we make two, right? Yeah. We made three. Yeah. And I felt that way at the time, you know. And we, we were like, okay, all for one and all, one for all. We're going for this thing, we're living this thing, we're doing this thing. We just had this shared passion. And so that helped us, that helped us. We were like great adventurers, we were going for it. It wasn't about how many records you sell. It wasn't, you know, we wanted to be successful. We wanted that, obviously. But that That's would be a byproduct, you know. It was like, let's make some great music, let's try. Yeah. That's, that's, that's what you need. Well, Annie, thank you so much. I mean, this has literally been you know, a 10 out of 10 experience. Oh, so, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Well, th thanks so much. 10 out of 10. Really, really That's brilliant. great. Thank you. And, uh, I mean, we could sit and talk about this. I could sit and talk about this with you. Yeah. For hours. Me too. We've only, we just, 